All right. Hey, good morning, everyone. I would just like to start off by saying that I'm only going to judge you for real sins this morning. Uh, no, I'm sorry, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> um, hey, so if this, is, if this is your first week here, I need you to know that I'm not the normal person that's up here. That's true. Um, which means that every week after this is up, it's, go, it's only going up after this, all right? Um, I, if you don't know me yet, really, my name's Wade. Uh, I'm one of the pastors here. I preach semi-regularly now, I guess. My wife's name is Tara. Um, what else do you need to know about me? I think the best way of getting to know someone is telling stories. And I don't, I actually don't like telling too many stories about myself from up here, but I feel like we're still getting to know one another, yeah? So anyway, Tara was traveling this week, and um, she does work with safe houses, still in the Western Cape from whence we came, and um, we have five children. And so I was at home attempting to homeschool children, um, intermittently praying, dear Lord, save me from my children, and dear Lord, save my children from me. And it was, I sound like David in the Psalms, quite frankly. I was, I was flipping, flopping. I was all over the place with it. And um, I was also praying this week, though, because I got some feedback from my last sermon. And, uh, you know, some of that feedback said, hey, Wade, yeah, we kind of need you to be more understandable. Well, I, th I, thought I, I thought I knew what you meant. And so this week I've been praying, dear Lord, help me to be understandable. And then yesterday, I went into a shop, and I go into the shop, and I say, hey, how, how y'all doing today? And the person looked at me, and they thought that I was joking, like I was like, you know, acting. And uh, she's like, oh, wow, you sound like a country accent. And I was like, you mean like a country song? And she was like, oh, wow, you actually sound like that. And so the dude that was working beside her was like, oh, you do sound like a country song. And, um, and so I said, well, you want me to sing for you? And so I sang them a country song. Yeah, yeah. Because it is a little known fact that I know that all of you like to hide the fact that you sometimes listen to country music. Yep, yep, that's true. That's where I'm gonna call you out on sin this morning. No. No, hey, uh, actually, here's what we're going to do now. That's, that's a little story about me. I'll try not to tell too many more stories about me. Instead, what we're going to do is we're gonna, I'm going to open up my Bible to Psalm 14. If you want to open up your Bible or your phone or whatever and check Instagram, well, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read it for us. And then a little bit later, we're going to dig back into those verses. Uh, so the translation I'm reading from right now, let me just tell, tell it to you like this. I have this struggle with Bible translations where I'm kind of like, I don't watch sports, okay? However, I'm kind of like a, an enthusiast when it comes to these things, right? So they're like, the translators, they're like the professional athletes, and I'm the fan that sits at home and is like, nah, you could have done better. You definitely could have done better. And they could have done better. But instead, I'm going to read from a translation, and then we're going to mix it up a little bit in the sermon, all right? So Psalm 14 the fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there is any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside together. They have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Have they no knowledge? All the evildoers who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the name of the Lord? There they are in great terror, for God is with the generation of the righteous. You would shame the plans of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, let Jacob rejoice. Let Israel 
be glad. Let me pray for us to get us started. Father, through your word and by your spirit, we ask that you would lead us and feed us today. We know, Lord, that you are with us in your word as we hear it. Lord, we know that you have placed your name on us in baptism. God, you have made us holy through your word of forgiveness in Jesus. And we ask again this morning, Lord, that you would repent us, that you would reshape us, that you would correct and comfort us towards lives that show your holiness. This we pray. Amen. The fool says, oh, wait, here's our big idea for this morning. Okay, if you're ever wondering what I'm talking about because I sound too country, here's the big idea. Everything is in ruins. Jesus has come to save and restore you. Everything is in ruins. Jesus has come to save and restore you. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupted. They have spiritually and morally gone off like old milk. They sin and corrupt, they, they sin and commit evil deeds. None of them does what is right. Uh, I don't know when was the last time you got called a fool. Um, maybe for me it happens more regularly than others, but what are we talking about when we hear the word fool here? Uh, look, when we read our Old Testament, that is the first larger part of our Bible, this word fool comes out and it doesn't mean that you are, um, uh, how can I say it? Here's what I mean. Okay, it means that your actions are bad. That's what it means. It does not depend upon your IQ. It does not depend upon your EQ. Thank God, okay? This is about bad action. That's what a fool is. It's someone that does foolish things. There's three different ways that the Bible talks about this. We don't really need to go into it except for to say that it's the shape of your moral character that determines whether or not you are a fool. Now, how in the world are we then going to judge what kind of moral character, character that you need to have in order to not be called a fool? Well, in Psalm 14 here, what is, what is the psalmist saying? the writer of the psalm, David, what is he saying? He's saying, you are corrupted and foolish if you claim that there is no God. Yeah. Now, do not misunderstand me right now and hear me saying, there's two things I don't want you to hear me saying this morning. I don't want you to just hear me talking about the sinfulness of people. We all know that. I don't just want you to hear me talk about how sinful you are. You know that. Okay, And I don't want you to hear me making fun of people outside of the faith calling them foolish. That's not what's happening here this morning. Now, that might be what the psalmist intended, right? Okay, now, this psalm was written to a particular people in a particular place at a particular time, and we need to understand it right there, and yet we also need to understand it here for us today. So who is this talking to? Well, clearly, it's speaking to those that are not a part of the people of God, right? Wait, we're going to come back to that. Because Paul's going to adjust that for us. And he's going to clear up just who exactly this psalm was being written to. Not just to the people that look like they're clearly outside of God's house. But also those that are firmly planted within it and denying who God is. They have spiritually and morally gone off like old milk. Okay, I added that bit in. Why? Why would I add that bit in? I'm doing the translator's work for him. That's why. Okay? They uh, Corrupt. Oh, well, Wade, you know, us South Africans, we know all about corruption. Um, look, listen, listen. Uh, we kind of use that word corrupt rightly. We use it rightly. All right? But here in the text, what we're talking about when we're talking about corrupt is, is not just someone that's doing bad things because they're morally bad people, all right? 
we're actually talking about something that should have been better and it isn't. All right, so here's another personal story. I, 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 the last one for the day, I promise. Um, when I was younger, uh, my dad, he was a gearbox mechanic, and I used to work at his shop. Literally, from the age of six years old, I was answering the phone saying, ATS Transmissions, this is Wade, how can I help you? And, um, <laughs> and what, look, I got to be a part of like a bro culture at my dad's shop. I loved it so much. That's where I was raised, actually. You might be able to tell. Anyway, one of the things, we had this one delivery driver who was much shorter than me, not making fun of short people, but I'll make fun of him. And he mocked me incessantly. This was a grown man, mocking like a 15-year-old boy. Mm -mm. I wasn't having that. And you know who didn't stand up for me? Any of the dudes working at my dad's shop. No one was standing up for me. And I said, hey, why does no one stand up for me? And they said, Wade, you got to learn to stand up for yourself. That's bro culture. I was like, okay, fine. So I stood up for myself. And one day, he, look, sometimes he drove this little, this little bus. And uh, one day he was making his deliveries. And so we had this old chunk of venison meat in the freezer. And I didn't tell anyone, but I took that chunk of venison meat and I hid it under the driver's seat of his bus. <laughs> Man, I was cool that day. Here's what I didn't know. Um, I forget his real name. We called him Denise. Anyway, here's what I didn't know is that he only drove that bus once a week. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here's what happened. Next week, he opens up his bus door, and it is like liquefied meat. Oh, man, guys, all over the place. And the thing is overrun with maggots and flies, and it's disturbing. And he couldn't wash it all out. That, that van was never the same after that. <laughs> That was corruption, all right? That thing was meant to be put onto the braai, cooked nicely, enjoyed. Instead, it became some sort of liquefied meat product covered with living creatures. That's corruption here. All right, we're actually echoing back to Genesis. Things were supposed to be one way. Then our first parents did something, and we went right along with them, and now it's a totally different way. It's corrupted. It's not the way that it was intended to be. St. Augustine, a uh, North African uh, saint, pastor, preacher, <laughs> says this, the person who, desire, who denies the existence of God has some reason for wishing that God did not exist. And this is where it hits us, rooted. Right? Because you can be ignorant. Now, the best way to test if someone's ignorant is to call them ignorant and see if they get offended. All right? Because it just means you don't know what you don't know, right? And they shouldn't get offended about that. They might not know something, all right? But we're not talking about ignorant people here. We're talking about you and me who have seen, heard the revelation of God, who God says he is to us and for us, and then we turn around and act like we don't need him. That's what we're pointing to here. So, no, we're not just talking about those outside of the household of God who deny the existence of God. No, we're talking about us in our actions. When we look around and we say, I think I can do this myself. We have a reason. Uh, we think we have a good reason for actively denying God's existence, if not verbally doing it. To which the psalmist says, you fool. What do we do when that happens? Well, we sin, we commit evil deeds. And not a single one of us is right. Those outside or inside the household. Yeah. The Lord looks down from heaven on everyone, everywhere. He looks to see if anyone is truly wise, if anyone seeks God. Now, Paul in Corinthians tells us that Jesus is the wisdom of God, yeah. right? You guys went through Hebrews. You walked through Hebrews. Jesus was everything in the book of Hebrews, right? He was the temple. He was this. He was that. He was everything, right? We know that Jesus is everything for us too. Jesus is the power of God into salvation, right? Jesus is also the wisdom of God, yeah? yeah? 
So how are we going to know if we're truly wise? If we're leaning on Jesus. Look, you could be intellectually a very stupid person <laughs> and yet be wise. If you're leaning on Jesus. And look, okay, hey, you know what we're doing? I'm, I'm dissecting it like it's, like it's something else, but we're actually reading poetry here. Yeah. Verse 2, this is, I, I love this. Um, the Lord looks down from heaven on everyone everywhere. What is it? He, does he do this occasionally? Uh, Eugene Peterson, in kind of a, a funny way in the message, it's a good way. He says, Jesus, or he says that God peeks his head out of heaven to see what's happening, okay? <laughs> it's, not a bad, it's not a bad translation, actually. It's pretty good. Now, does that mean that he only does this every once in a while? No, he's always doing it. He's always doing it. Let's move on to verse 3 here. I'm, whoo, whoo. But no, all have turned away. All have become corrupt. No one does good, not a single one. This, this foolishness that we read about in verse 1 and this corruption that we're we're hearing again. Again, it's, it's something that's spoiled. It's something that's gone off. Um, maybe it's just something that hasn't gone right. I jokingly said earlier that we might use corruption the wrong way. No, no, no. It's good to call politicians. Am I allowed to say? Yeah. Let's just say everyone corrupt, okay? It's good to call everyone corrupt. And yet that's also assuming that that person started off in a good place. <laughs> they didn't. They didn't. <laughs> They've always been that way. If I were to quote my good friend Edgar, who isn't here today, they're bad people, okay? <laughs> Not talking about those people in particular, just certain people. Okay, anyway. Um, hey, part of verse 1, though, and, and then verse 3, we do have some commentary on this, this, this poetry, on this song, from the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 3, if you want to turn there, you can. It's, I'm going to be reading verses 9 through 20. But you know what? The word of God was made to be heard, so if you just need to close your eyes and hear it, I love that too. Paul's going to be asking us some questions. What then? Are we Jews better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. And here is where we understand that he's talking about both those inside and outside the household of God. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. He's going to continue quoting, but it's not all from Psalm 14 from here on out. It's from a bunch of other Psalms. It's from Jeremiah. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom, uh, I'm, I'm going to mess up this word, so we're just going to say poisonous snakes. The venom of poisonous snakes is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. In the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. We're going to move on to verse 19 there in just a minute. But let's just sit there for just one second in Romans. There is no fear of God before their eyes. This is, this is how you, you judge the fool. This is how you judge how foolish you are. You can pull out your little foolish meter and you can judge where you're at by leveling out your, your, your fear of God. That is, you have to understand that God is peeking out from heaven, right? He's looking down right now and he is telling you through his word this morning, he's telling you primarily through his son Jesus who he is and who he is for you. And so right now, Rooted, you are standing before the face of God. It takes a lot of, of, of uh, work, if I could say it like this, to, to understand the weight of that. That's why this psalm this morning isn't like our last two psalms. The first one focusing a lot on wisdom and being planted in the word, being planted right beside Jesus and, 
and, and, and having strong roots because of it. Roots. Roots. Rooted. Uh, <laughs> roots because of it. Yeah. Last week, looking at the majesty of God. But you notice what One did last week. After each and every verse, it's like, majesty of God, Jesus. Why do we do that? There's this time in the Old Testament where Moses speaks to God. And he says, look, if I could just see you. And what does God say back? He's like, okay, if you see me, you're going to die. So, quite literally, I'll show you my backside. Okay, I think we're talking the whole backside. We're not just talking about the backside, okay? But the whole backside, yeah? And, and, and last week in Psalm 8, actually... Um, a, another church father, not St. Augustine, another one from, from Jerusalem, said that Psalm 8 is kind of like the backside of God. We're seeing all of the glory, all the majesty, but if we saw it in full, it would kill us. Therefore, we have to turn to Jesus at the end of every verse. Jesus, in a really funny way, he, he's walking across water, okay? And his disciples, are, they're freaking out on the boat, and they're, ah, we see a ghost, Right? And um, what, is it, what does it say? It's this crazy thing that the gospel says there. It says, he was walking by, he intended to go past them. Yeah. Quite literally, they saw his backside because they, he intended to go past them. He was just walking to the next destination. Yeah. You believe this guy? <laughs> this was Jesus saying, I am God. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to show you all of myself on the cross, but I'm going to show you my backside as I walk by. And you guys are freaking out on the water, okay? Here this morning, uh, we want to see rightly <laughs> the backside of God. We need to have a fear of him if we're going to take him seriously enough to think that our foolishness means anything other than, yeah, you know, I'm just being me. I'm just doing me. Now we know, verse 19 of Romans 3, now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Hey, this is rough, guys. Um, there's going to be parts of my sermon today that you're going to hear me saying, you should do this. And there's going to be parts of my sermon today where you're going to hear, Jesus has done this for you. This is the beauty of the Christian life. Here's the danger of a, of a just a, oh, ugh, just a bible life, okay? Hear me out. Here's the danger of just a bible life. And just hearing things that you should be doing and you're not doing. Because what does the law do, according to Paul? That is, do this. What does the law do? It shows you your sin. It condemns you. That's the only thing the law can do. Now, it does good things. In showing you the sin, it does good things. It says, hey, this is how you could be acting. Great, that's a good thing to hear. This is how you should be acting. That's a good thing to hear. This is what you actually look like. That's not a good thing to hear. Yeah? Yeah? This is, this is how the world stays in order, generally speaking, with this general law that I'm going to share with you. And yet, that law doesn't change the world. Everything's in ruins. You know it. When I say ruins, I'm talking spiritually and morally. Just like we read in verse 1 there. They have spiritually and morally gone off like old milk. You know the world's in ruins. And you know that you're a part of it. <laughs> it affects us. We affect it. So, if me standing up here from God's word and saying, do this, doesn't change you. If me standing up here and saying, do this, doesn't give you faith and save you, what is? What's going to do that for you? Don't they know anything? Verse 4. All these predators, this comes from the message. Don't they know anything, all these predators? 
Don't they know that they can't get away with this treating people like a fast food meal over which they're too busy to pray? What, what, what did our, our first translation say? There, it's, it's not a bad translation. Have they no knowledge, all the evildoers who eat up my people as they eat bread? Right, we pray for our daily bread, right? They, look, bread was a, a simple daily thing. Easy, quick. Maybe not the most nutritious all the time, but it did fill the tummy, right? Th that's what the psalmist is saying here. That's why I like this uh, treating people like fast food. Is it good for you? No. Does it fill you up for a very short period of time? Yes. Is it killing you? Yeah. Does it feel good while you're doing it? Yeah, it does. It does. It's a, it feels like it's going to be a good death until it isn't, right? <laughs> but not only that, not only is this, this, this meal just so simple and so easy and you just throw it back you don't even think about thanking God for it in the midst of it. This is what the evildoers do, right? This isn't the only place that we, we see in Scripture. Um, I'm just going to be reading a bunch of various texts real quick. Because um, verse, full, verse 4 is just full of stuff that we should touch on. But this, this knowledge, not having understanding... Um, <sighs> okay, let me, let me start with this one. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 3. The ox knows its owner, the donkey knows its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. I love that. That, that kind of harkens back to my last sermon on Palm Sunday. That little donkey Jesus riding up into the city, right? Knows his master. Everyone else is cheering for Jesus, but they don't know who he is. Or Jeremiah 4. <laughs> oh, this, is, this is the most cutting one. For my people are foolish. They know me not. They are stupid children. They have no understanding. They are wise in doing evil. But how to, but how to do good, they know not. Or what about this killing God's people and eating the poor, causing injustice? There are those, uh, Proverbs, there are those whose teeth are swords, whose fangs are knives, to devour the poor from the earth, the needy from mankind. Or Jeremiah, pour out your wrath on the nations. They know you not. And on the peoples that, call upon your, that do not call upon your name, they have devoured your people. They have devoured and consumed them. They have laid waste their homes. We could keep going, but... Micah 3 is probably the worst sounding. Who eat the flesh of my people and flay their skin from off of them and break their bones in pieces and chop them up like meat in a pot, like flesh in a cauldron. And then this calling on the name of the Lord in verse 4, which we sang about this morning. Jeremiah says, Pour out your wrath on the nations that know you not, and on the peoples that call not on your name, for they have devoured Jacob, they have devoured him and consumed him, and have laid waste their homes. Or Psalm 79, pour out your anger on the nations that do not know you, and on the kingdoms that do not call upon your name. This calling upon the name is, is really important here. And it's why our translation up here emphasizes a fast food meal which you don't even pray over. When we're praying, what are we doing? We're calling upon the name of the Lord. When's a good time to pray? Anytime's a good time to pray, right? But let's be honest, when do we actually pray? When we understand that we are in need and that we can't do it on our own. That's when we call upon the name of the Lord. We heard this morning that the name of the Lord saves. It does. He does. I brought up baptism in my prayer this morning. You know what I love about baptism? And, and let me pause right there. If you know Jesus as your Savior and you haven't been baptized yet, you can talk to Pastor Jono, okay? We're going to be doing some baptism soonish, very soonish. Um, I don't know how. I've never been prepped in how to heat the tank 
So maybe it'll be a cold bath. No, I'm joking. It won't be a cold bath, I promise. But here's the beautiful thing that I love about baptism is that uh, it's the good news of Jesus with your name put on it. All right, so, so always here at Rooted, you should be hearing the gospel, the good news about who Jesus is for you. You should always be hearing it in the present tense. Not that it was just a historical event that might eh, or might not apply to you. Also, it's without exception. Doesn't matter who you are or where you're coming from. And then lastly, you. It's for you. For all of you that already know Christ as your Savior, once again this week, know this. Jesus' death and resurrection is for you. His forgiveness is gifted to you. Beautiful thing about baptism is you get that gospel not just with a you attached to it, but with your name attached to it. Right? Pastor Oni gets to stand up here and baptize so-and-so in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's the good news. That's the gospel with your name on it. Oh, I love it. Terror, 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 terror will grip them, for God is with those who obey him. All right, now this is hard. We're going to have to stretch ourselves just a little bit before we make it to the end of this passage. For those who obey him. Disqualified. What are we supposed to do with this? Let's, you know what? I don't like it. Let's look at other translations, shall we? <laughs> Who does what is right? Okay, no. Terror will grip them, for God is with the generation of the just. Yikes. God is with those who are the victims. Well, that's not me. The godly, also not me. The company of the righteous, probably not me. The righteous generation. Probably not me. What's it going to take to get us there? Oh, man, we're stuck again. What's it going to take to get us there? Look, when we're reading the Psalms and we see just and we see righteous, what are we talking about? The only thing that can make us just and righteous, the only person that can make us just and righteous, that is Jesus. Now, for God's first people, as they heard this song, some of them said, whew, I got to do better. And some of them said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's the generation of the just, of the righteous. That's who is being spoken of here right now. It's everyone that looks at their life according to being called a fool and corrupt, who's gone off like spoiled milk or venison, <laughs> and we say, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. You know who you are? You're in the generation of the just. You're in the generation of the righteous. You are the godly. You are the one who does right. Um... It used to be, now Tara stopped drinking coffee a long time ago because uh, we had lots of children and she didn't do it during that period. I still drink coffee like a fiend. But before we had children, every morning I, I got up bleary-eyed and I made coffee and I made oatmeal and then we sat down together. Now I try to fend off the children from our bedroom so that they won't wake Tara up. I try to be a good husband, yeah. But let's be honest, let's be honest. Do I have other motivations. I do. I don't like a cranky Tara. I don't like a cranky Tara. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to protect her sleep and I'm going to fend off those children. Get out of here, kids. I'm going to try to do it as quietly as I can. Yeah. Yeah. You know, does that make what I did bad by fending off the children and, and making sure that Tara is prepared for the day? No, it doesn't make it bad. No. Does it make it a bit selfish? Yeah, it does. Ah, Here's the thing, all of my good deeds, all my good deeds, there's just a tinge of a little too much me in there. 
Yeah, yeah. We need a little bit more Jesus in those things, yeah? And that's why Jesus says, I'm going to take your just okay deeds, and I'm going to call them good by placing my name upon them. To where now, when I do something nice for Terry, yeah, it's pretty nice, but you know what? The really good news about it is she received it and Jesus received it, both as his work done in my place. The wicked frustrate the plans of the oppressed, but the Lord will protect his people. I'm not done yet. <laughs> Other translations maybe say it better. The Lord is their refuge or the Lord is their trust. He's the one that they can trust in. Those that are oppressed, those who are put off, pushed off to the side. You know, uh, where we came from in the Western Cape, uh, uh, and for many of you, your experiences of where you come from, uh, the, the concept of oppression is daily invisible. Um, here, we can kind of hide from it a little bit, right? We can hide in our cars, we can turn the music up, we can hide in our homes, shut the curtains. But the truth is that uh, we can't actually hide from it. It's everywhere. Tara, going back there this past week and having to uh, be right in the midst of that again in her role in, in uh, child welfare. Uh, sure, stories are hard. The Lord was Tara's refuge, her trust this week. Uh, and for these children, they're getting placed in this home. The Lord is their refuge and their trust. All right, verse 7. Who will come from Mount Zion to rescue Israel? When the Lord restores his people, Jacob will shout with joy, and Israel will rejoice. All right, we've got a lot of Jewish stuff to work through here. Don't, don't, just, don't, just, don't just take it as words that you should understand. Let's hear it for what it is for us. When we're talking about Israel here, who are we talking about? Well, Right here, we're talking about Israel. Right now, we're talking about you, the people of God. Jacob will shout for joy, and Israel will rejoice. Who's Jacob? Jacob is Israel. <laughs> Who's Israel? Israel's Israel. Okay, all right. That's good. God's people will shout for joy. They will rejoice. When, though? When and if something happens? No, that's not what it says. When the Lord restores his people, it's a promise. It's not a matter of if the Lord will restore his people. It's a promise. This is the other beautiful thing. Uh, when we take part in the Lord's Supper together, when we uh, witness and, and, and take part in, take, become witnesses of baptism, uh, do we hear it as a command? Hey, you know what? You should really get in that water. Hey, you should really come up here and take it because that's what Christians do. Yeah, we do kind of hear it as a command. It is, it is actually commanded of us. Actually, it's commanded of us to baptize, right? And yet, how do you receive it? You receive it as gift. Because everything that God demands of us in Jesus, he also promises to us. There's nothing that is commanded of you that is not also gifted to you by Jesus. The restoration of God's people, that is you, is inevitable. Now, where do we start off here? Everything is in ruins. Jesus has come to save and restore you. Well... He has come to save and restore you. He's done it already. It's past tense, it's present tense, and you know what? He's going to keep on doing it. And yet, here's what we also need to hear. Because everything is in ruins, the world around us, the corruption, the foolishness, here's what we also need to hear, that just like with God's first people, Israel, where there was like land connected to these, these good promises of restoration. Uh, 
from the very beginning, God has always had a people. Uh, it started off with your first parents, Adam and Eve, and he put them in a place that he made just for them, and he made it complete. Yeah? And then, and then he called Abraham, and he said, I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to give you a people and a place. Yeah? And this sounded like the restoration of that garden. Sounded like a great, great plan. Israel took that promise like, yes, this is our promise. Right now, you, church, are in the place that God has designed for you. Right here in this hall, this is where he's placed you. He's designed you for this place. He wants you here. He has saved you little by little. You're never going to make it fully, but he's restoring you too. But one day, it's not just you that he's saving and restoring. It's the place that he has forever designed you to be. This Mount Zion. What are we talking about? This is God's heavenly garden city where he dwells and where he has promised that he will be forever with you. You have been saved. You have been forgiven. You are being restored. And one day, what that looks like is you having a seat beside Jesus in God's heavenly kingdom that is now here and making this beautiful garden that was into a beautiful garden city where you and all things will be restored. To that we can say amen. And let, 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 me, let me say it like this, one last thing. Uh, one of my, I didn't bring it up here, but one of my favorite books that I have for our children, it's on the Lord's Prayer. And um, I'm just gonna read the text from that, okay? Lord, teach us to pray. So this is about the last part of the Lord's Prayer. Lord, teach us to pray, amen. Does God really hear us when we pray, when we call upon his name? Yes. He is more eager to listen than we are to pray. We can be sure he hears our prayers because we have his command and his promise, call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you. That's why we can say amen, because God's promises are always true and sure. Our Father in heaven, you love us just like you love Jesus. Amen. Amen.